Joining us today is Dr. Samir Bhatt to speak about the latest report by the Imperial College COVID-19 response team. This report focused on estimated numbers of infections and impact of non-pharmaceutical interventions in 11 countries in Europe. Welcome. Thanks for having me. What questions did you answer when writing this report? Well, as many know, our, our department specializes in outbreaks. And when we, when we started on this, we, we wanted to assess what impact and what changes interventions are having um, on the number of infections. And so when I say infections, I'm talking about people who've caught COVID, um, but not necessarily only the ones that show symptoms. There are a lot of people who potentially are asymptomatic and we don't actually know what this number is. So we wanted to know what were the changes in um, the number of infections or the number of cases to some degree. And so we looked at the data and quickly we realized it, it was very difficult to disentangle and, and figure out what the signal would be from looking at the case data. And this makes sense. I'm sure that a lot of the audience have been watching Worldometer, particularly during the early stages and watching the, the ECDC um, for, for the changes. And, you know, unfortunately, a lot of these cases, they change when a country changing testing policy. And I'm not saying this is a good or bad thing, but the, the data is profoundly biased on cases. You, we, we don't know what's going on just from the case data. It misses people who got ill and might have just stayed home. It misses people who are ill and don't even know it because they aren't showing symptoms. And as time goes by, when an epidemic gets more and more um, in, its, in its full swing for a country such as Italy, um, the, the case testing data is only showing a vanishingly small amount. And so we more somberly um, thought, let's look at the death data. Now, the death data is not without its own problems, of course. Right? A lot of you'll see a lot in the news that um, there's a lot of underreporting in Italy, but by and large, it's far, far better than cases. And so we thought, okay, well, ca can we find out the signal of what's going on in the COVID um, epidemic from the death data? And can we explain what's going on as a result of these interventions? Can we see if they've had no impact and can we see if they have? All right. And how did you answer these questions? So we use um, a gold standard form of statistical modeling called Bayesian hierarchical modeling. And I know it's a fancy term, but basically what it is, is a back calculation. We start from deaths and we say, well, we've observed these deaths reasonably accurately. There is some uncertainty, but not a huge amount. We don't expect deaths to be three orders of magnitude higher than what we see observed, for example. And then we say, well, these deaths had to occur from some infections. And these infections have a certain infection fatality rate. We, we then bring in as much information as we can on epidemiological parameters. And these, again, sound complicated, but they're not really. It's how long does it take, on average, from somebody to get from infection to an onset of symptoms, if they get symptoms? And then how long does that, more somberly, result in death? And how long that time goes? And we don't treat anything as a single number. We treat everything as a probability, representing our uncertainty about all these things. So we back calculate infections from death. And then from infections, we say that infections are driven by a rate of transmission. That's how fast things are happening. If you want an intuition of this, I'm sure many have seen this on the graphs. Uh, think of it as a doubling time in its most simplest form. But it's something a little bit more complicated called the reproduction number, um, which, which is a rate of transmission. So we wanted to see how this reproduction number was changing over time when various interventions came in. And we now have this hierarchical framework that we developed. And we wanted to see, well, OK, what interventions are going to matter? So we had to go out, collect standardized information on intervention data and um, put those together and try to see what happens when we when we estimate this latent infection parameter in our model, so to speak. What are the key findings of the report? So the key findings of the report are that it does seem that interventions have had a big impact on the rate of transmission. So we think that interventions have had an effect. And for many countries, most of them, in fact, the doubling time or the reproduction number is somewhere close to one, which means it's it slowed down quite a bit. Now, that, that's the good news. The bad news is that there's so much uncertainty on all of this that we don't know exactly how low it is or how high it is. We can just say that it has reduced and it's somewhere around one but it's most certainly not statistically below one, which means the epidemic would die out and we'd be in a containment phase where we need to prevent repeated epidemics happening. 
And it, it's not sufficiently massively above one where we're in an unmitigated epidemic. But it, if it is above one, we, we're in this flattening the curve regime. And it's a matter of how much we flatten the curve. The epidemiological parameters we have now are based on what we observe in other countries and in unique experiences like the Diamond Princess, which was very un unfortunate for the individuals in involved in there, but it gave us a lot of epidemiological information. And we take these and we, and we input them in the model. Now, these will get refined as time goes by, but this is the best we know now. And we at Imperial never just rest on the best we know now. We always update our results to reflect the most current information that we have. So that's caveat number one. Caveat number two is a lot of countries have just implemented interventions today. Now, there's a big lag between deaths and infections. When somebody gets infected, there's some time until they get some symptoms, if they get symptoms. And then there's some time until they end up going through the healthcare system, to critical care, to eventual unfortunate death. And because of that lag, just looking at deaths in a country that's implemented interventions a week ago, you might not have enough signal. Yes, some people might have died in that period, but not the bulk that would have died or will die. And so we need to leverage information from older epidemics. And so a key assumption is that if what we observe as the impact in countries like Spain and, and Italy is true in other countries, then these are the impacts we'll see. So how do these findings support decision making um, in general? And more specifically, how useful are these findings for other countries that were not included in the results of your reports? That's an excellent question. Um, so I think I, I, my personal view is that uh, science should be um, a multifaceted uh, endeavor. There are many different lines and strands of evidence that come together that ultimately get reported to those who make decisions. And then they make decisions based on these. This provides one cog suggesting that the reproduction numbers or the rate of transmission has gone down due to these interventions. But we don't know enough decisively to say relax interventions, most certainly. There's a huge amount more work looking at Imperial and at other really great institutions across the UK, um, looking at bed occupancy, looking at um, ICU capacity, um, clinicians on the ground seeing what's going on, um, pharmaceutical endeavors trying to search for other interventions, um, looking at people's behaviors from surveys and seeing what that's, how that's working. There's, there's a huge line of other evidence. These things have to be assessed daily based on updated best data and made by those who, who, who factor in all the different decisions and, and, and evidence out there. Hoping to expand our code base and start bringing in more different countries. We have people in the team looking at this and being applied in the US setting as well. And so I think that we have a lot of interesting follow-ups on this that could be very useful to both the general audience who want to understand what's going on in their country and to researchers and policymakers as one cog of evidence in their decision-making structure. Thank you. What, what is the next step going forward? What are you focusing your work on now? So currently in the team, we are looking at more European countries, um, Portugal, the Netherlands, Greece, and a few others. We want to do all of them. It's just we do need sufficient amount of data to to actually run this model. But we're, we're watching it countries very carefully and working with researchers if we can in these countries so that we can make this a very collaborative endeavor. And we're also looking at this in uh, the USA right now. So members of the team are leading this in the USA. And um, we're trying to work with uh, researchers there as well. Thank you for taking the time to speak with us today. Thanks for having me on.